This is The Express with Gary Allen, your 360-degree view of the world. Now, here's your host, Gary Allen. And good evening, everybody, and welcome to this edition of uh, The Express. I hope everybody's having a good holiday season. It's a, I hope the weather's fine wherever you are. I know it's been chilly the last, uh, oh, couple of days or so. So um, down here in Florida, it's a bit nippy, but I hope everybody's getting through it. And for those of you in Alabama, what's wrong with you people? Apparently, Roy Moore is going to win uh, the senatorial race up there, and I can't quite figure you people out to save my soul, but uh, oh well. That's what makes politics what it is, but I have a feeling uh, he's not going to be sitting in that seat for very long. Uh, I want to thank everybody for tuning in tonight. Gary Allen with you here, of course, as I am. Uh, We have one more show, and then we'll be off for about three weeks until after the first of the year. Looking forward to taking a little bit of time off. I know lately we've had to uh, due to one issue or another, but uh, believe me, I I can use the rest right about now. and I won't get into why. But I hope everybody's having a good time. Randy, I know you. hopefully you're out there, and uh, EW will let me know, of course, if you are. And I hope you are, and I hope all the listeners have a happy holiday season. Uh, for those of you that want to keep up with me, you can do so on Facebook at Gary Allen, A-L-A-N, YouTube.com, Gary Allen, The Express. Thursday night, this program will repeat itself on our sister network, DiversityBroadcastNetwork.com, as well as ProgressiveVoices.com and a bunch of other places. After the first of the year, once my website is up and running, I'll be able to let you know about some of the other places that you'll be able to locate. And some of the, you'll go into my website and go onto the link section. And from there, you'll be able to connect to my shows on a variety of different other podcast sites. And I'm really looking forward to that. As I said, uh, we have a very interesting show for you tonight. My guest is uh, Jason Dowd. Jason will be joining us in just a couple of minutes. As a matter of fact, he's just on the phone with us now. Uh, Jason Dowd, nationally exhibited photographic artist who is best known for his uh, series Dreams, Nightmares, Fears, and Fantasy. It is a multi-award winning artist. He is. His work has been honored by Coca-Cola as well. And in 2008, he photographed then-Senator Barack Obama on the campaign trail. Um, his uh, illustrious mask steampunk collection can be seen at Walt Disney's Epcot in Orlando, and a 3D series is on the display across the U.S., wowing people with the ability to bring simple photograph to life. Dowd is the host of the AME TV and radio show, nationally syndicated art, music, and entertainment outlets, and the producer of the AMFM 247 broadcast network. He's married, and he's a huge Walt Disney fan. Um, oh, and, uh, that makes him a very special kind of a guy. Uh, Jason, are you with us tonight? I am. And thank you so much for joining us here on uh, the Express. I thought I'd do my little Mickey Mouse for you just to uh, <laughs> just just to make you feel a little bit at home. Jason and I have been conversing over the last couple of days, and uh, I, I will tell you, uh, his work is some of the finest I've ever seen. Uh, ImageNationStudios.com. Uh, Facebook.com slash Dowd Studios um, Art, and on Twitter, at Dowd Studios. So you'll be able to get a hold of them there. We'll talk about that. Mention it a number of times before the evening is out. Um, Jason, let's start a, when you were young. Um, and, and, of course, one of the things that I, I, I talked about that we were going to talk about is your fabulous series, uh, which is being – uh, scene around, uh, which includes uh, masks and environment from about 100 and was it 95 different countries. We're going to talk about that one as we get into the program a little bit. But Jason, where did your interest in art begin and um, what helped cultivate it and keep it moving forward? Well, it actually kind of began when I saw my dad, you know, getting behind a, ca- a camera and going out and taking pictures and stuff. And he used to take black and white photos of my, my great my great grandparents, my grandparents, uh, anything he could, and you know, I just loved the look of the camera. Mm-hmm. And when I started to want to play with the camera, obviously it was a Hasselblad, and those were very expensive, so I, that was a no-no. So he went to and he gave he gave me um, a uh, flat one of those um, I think it was 18 millimeter uh, flash cubes, and um, I just went to town with it, and I had a lot of fun. And and even when I was really young, I was seeing things at a different light. 
and mm-hmm. I tried to make, I tried to create depth and try to create some type of feeling inside the photos as I would see it. And people started telling me that even, even though the photos weren't good, you know, I was only like six, seven years old, they still said that, you know, I had a vision for something. So when we, uh, when I started to get into my own camera and um, I had one that I really, really loved and, and I was in high school and I went out to San Diego and I actually was dangling off of a cliff up in the mm. Alcone uh, uh, Valley and taking a picture looking down over what is now Qualcomm Stadium. Mm. And uh, that, that picture, even though, it was, even though it was a point and shoot camera, um, the, the depth of it, the, the perspective of it actually won me an award here in, uh, in the, the Tampa Bay area. And I just kind of fell in love with it after that. But I've always been into the arts. I loved, I loved taking art classes when I was in school. I went to do stuff with, like, fine art. Uh, it's uh, mm-hmm. painting, you know, uh, pastels, charcoals, inks, all kinds of different things. I loved it. Mm-hmm. And it's just something that I've always been passionate about. And I think if it wasn't for art, I don't know if I'd be as much as I, as I would be in this world today because I was never a sports person. You know, mm. and I really wasn't one of those type of people that like to sit. I mean, I did well in school, but I didn't want to sit behind a book and yeah. and study all my time. So, it re- art was really my 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 road to who I am today. And that's and that's really important, and particularly when you learn it at a very young age. Uh, you got into art, and and uh, you know, for me and and a lot of people who are in talk shows or who have been in show business, and you and I have talked about my world a little bit in the last few days, I got involved in, in theater and stuff because that's where all the chicks were, (laughs) you know? And I mean, and I see it in your photography too. I'm going to tell you, you, uh, you, you really, I mean, my God, some of the stuff that you do is just absolutely unbelievable. Now. So you say your first creation per se was in San Diego, which by the way, I'm very familiar with San Diego. I, I, when I lived in Los Angeles, I used to go down there, uh, quite a bit. And I always liked Balboa Park myself. Mm-hmm. Um, I always enjoyed that. I used to en- enjoy going to the different museums. I never cared for um, SeaWorld. Um, I'm not a fish person. Um, I can appreciate the beauty of of the sea creatures and everything, but I was never – but I always liked San Diego. Uh, as a matter of fact, my last stage show that I did with Michael Blue Blay was in San Diego. That was over almost two years ago now. Um, but yeah, that was my last thing. And I always liked San Diego a great deal. I always used to like going down there, the Coronado Island and stuff. So San Diego was a, a a jumping off point for you. You lived there for a number of years. I take it then. I never lived there. I was out actually just visiting my grandfather and uh, my grandfather lived there his pretty much his whole life, except for when he was living with my grandmother in Connecticut. Oh. And so I got to, I got a rare opportunity to go see him, and I was out there for about a month, and I got to see the the landscapes. I, he took me all over the place. I got to go see a couple of baseball games, and <clears throat> saw some really cool stuff out there. And it was yeah. just it was just really interesting because the East Coast architecture and the East Coast uh, climates and and even even the water is completely different from the Pacific Coast, mm-hmm. and I was just fascinated by it. And it's gorgeous out there. Oh yeah. It's um, my my uh, ex-wife used to say that it's one of the many places where God lost the shoe, um, that uh, it really is beautiful. For those of you that have never been out on the West Coast, uh, it really is beautiful. And, and what Mother Nature has done with it, with the ocean and stuff, it really is fantastic. I mean, it, it truly, truly is. So I can understand your appreciation for it. Um what were your next steps? I mean, you came back. Where were you living at the time when you were visiting your grandfather? I was living here in the Tampa Bay area. I've been down here since 1990, basically. We moved just right around Christmas time. I mm-hmm. uh, born and raised in, in Bristol, Connecticut, uh, ah. and I lived in Southington, Connecticut. So I know ESPN when it was just a wee little baby and yeah. uh, before it became what it is now. And uh, it just uh, – I miss I miss my my roots in New England, but there's a lot of New England if you look in my pictures and you look in what I mm-hmm. do because it is me. I mean that is my home. That is where I was born and raised for most of my life. And then when I moved down here, I was pretty much just getting into the high school area. So I I was done with school, but my most impers- my, where I was most visual with mm-hmm. all the stuff that I that I learned growing up. My grandfather would take me to the old cemeteries out in uh, Cal- up in Connecticut there, some some of them from the 1600s, 1700s. And, you know, I got to go see those old Victorian houses and, and just the architecture up there just 
wows me. I love mm. it. So you can kind of see that in some of the stuff that I've done, and, and it, yeah. it did have an impression, an impression on me. But I have lived here for a long time now, and, and um, I'm trying to incorporate and show people what I used to love growing up where I was, where I was born in, in New England. And it's kind of hard to do that here when there's beaches surrounding you. But regardless, yeah. there's a way of making it happen, and you can do it if you just put a little bit of imagination into it. Yeah, a great deal of difference between New England and Tampa Bay um, or, or Florida in general. I mean, uh, the, the fact is that while there's a lot of beautiful things about Florida, it, it doesn't have the uh, – uh, uh, it doesn't have the history. It doesn't have the 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 historical aspects to it um, that that New England does because you can go in in New England anywhere whether it's Connecticut or Bristol Connecticut area or Boston or New Hampshire or Maine or anywhere in there and you're going to find something of historical note um, you know the Florida history isn't that rich and it doesn't go back that far uh, but there is one here. Uh, so I imagine uh, bringing what you would consider to be uh, steampunk and you're into Gotham culture, and I, which we're going to now talk about a little bit. Um, and I would imagine that all came from the fact that you were taken to grave sites and, and, and architectural things in New England that, that you kind of gravitated in that direction. It is. I mean, what was really cool about going to the grave sites is that these are people that came here before us. You know, they kind of laid the foundation to the cities, the, the buildings that we see, the jobs that were around there, the culture that we that we experienced. And I had a huge respect for that. And I was actually around a haunted cemetery that was kind of almost in my backyard. And it was called the Green Lady Cemetery. And most of the people there were War of 1812, something like that. Mm -hmm. But, you know, there's just so much history behind it. And I love that. I loved how the, I loved how it's a it's like a pre, it's a preservation of history. But uh, as far as the houses, my great grand my great aunt I should say was in a house that my great grandfather had bought when he moved over here from Germany, and it was built in the late 1600s. And it was not anything like the Victorian houses that you'd see, but it was just more of like a, a regular old colonial house. And the history of that house was phenomenal. I mean, it kind of had – she still cooked on the original um, wood-burning wood, wood stove, mm -hmm. and it had, um, it had so much history to it. But we, when we looked into it, it was actually put on the, the um, National uh, Historic house, of, house Registry because of the fact that it was a part of a bed and breakfast back in the 1700s. And they do have records of, of George Washington staying there with his troops as they were marching down through huh. the Connecticut area. And um, what was really cool is one day we were spending the night over there. I was sleeping in the, in the living room or what they would call a parlor. And uh, we, I went downstairs, and I, I was always told never to go downstairs in the basement. Well, I saw that one of, their, one of the, the, the stairs was kind of like, kind of like broken. I could see into it. And I saw that there was like a, a book under there. So I pulled the stair up a little bit grabbed the book out and I realized it was a bunch of old pictures from this like 18, uh, 1800s and early 1900s. So me and my cousins, we were all spending the night up there. We went upstairs and we were sitting in the parlor looking at it and we realized that these are pictures of old uh, funerals that happened in this house uh, hmm. because that was very common back then. And yes. ironically, where I was sleeping, the caskets were. <laughs> so, yes. you know, that made it very nice and easy to sleep that night for sure. But, um, you know, it's stuff like that that does that does have that type of it gives me that 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 feeling, that sense that I've grown up with. So it does have a, a profound impact mm -hmm. on on how I see things. You know, I was thinking about something the other night, and this has nothing to do with with you know. I, I didn't know this part of the conversation was going to come up, but I was raised in Pennsylvania, and back in the day, uh, people would not the funeral homes weren't that big of a deal, and people were buried out of their homes. And every parlor, every front room, what you I guess you'd call it a parlor or a front room, there'd always be this big table, long, long table and, you know, with firm legs underneath it. And that's where the casket would be while the viewing was going on, because, uh, again, before funeral homes became the fashion, if you can say it that way, uh, people were buried from their homes. And they always had this one area in the front room. And, uh, you know, I never really thought about it very much. But, yeah, that's where we would always put the Christmas tree up every year, uh, along with the trains and, and everything else. When you were living in Connecticut, by the way, we're talking to Jason Dowd here on the Express. 
with Gary Allen. Um, Jason is internationally exhibited photographer, artist, and uh, he currently uh, has a series, as soon as I can uh, get to the page right here, because it's very, very, very important. Uh, he has a series of, of, of a collection, a work of collection portraying the different cultures from around the world. Um, he has 195 different countries. The goal is to educate and fight racism, which we are going to get into in just a little while. But um, uh, did you get to go to Mark Twain's house while you were in New England at all? Oh, you know it. I wouldn't have been. I wouldn't have gone out of, uh, out of that place without seeing that at least once. Um, I used to go there all the time, actually, and I used to go to Harriet Beecher Stowe's house, which is right across the the uh, basically the lots. I mean, you could walk to the house, so you could see it from the, the front door of Mark Twain's house. Mm -hmm. And both were very prominent, you know, authors in in our in our American history. And so it was really be it was really cool to be able to just go up there and see these houses. And Mark Twain's house is so phenomenal. I mm -hmm. mean, it is. It is a gingerbread, what they call it like a gingerbread house because it has so many amazing ornate features outside of it, but it also inside has its own atrium where, where trees would grow. And you could go sit in there, you'd walk into the living room and sit in this big glass atrium, and th there's trees. I mean, it was just, it, it was phenomenal. And he did such a great job in that house. Yeah. And I can only imagine just sitting down. <laughs> on the front porch of that Mark Twain's house and looking across at Harry Beecher Stowe's house because they lived there around the same time. So mm -hmm. I, I know that they were neighbors. What conversations they must have had. Yes, yes. And and it's a shame that he lost the house. Um, I guess he went broke or he, somewhere along the line, he lost the house. But that's the charm and the ambiance about New England. Or, or for that matter, any place you can go. You can go to where I kind of lived for a number of years of my life in Chicago or in Pennsylvania, where I'm from, wilkes barre it's a coal mining area. Any place that has a history to it, uh, a rich history of ethnic backgrounds and people coming in from all sorts of uh, parts of the world, and they bring their traditions with them and their cultures, there's going to be a rich history in that community. And I think that Connecticut stands out because an awful lot of people did – uh, live in Connecticut and New England and Boston. Uh, Maine is an interesting place for architecture as well. Mm -hmm. It sure is. What? Um, how would you describe your styles? I mentioned steampunk. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. For those of us that are not familiar with steampunk, what is steampunk? Steampunk is a mixture of a Victorian style, uh, Edwardian style of dress, which is basically, if you really want to kind of get an idea of, of the time frame, it's like mid-1800s to early, early 1900s, and that's kind of when the Victoria era kind of moved in, in with it at the same time. So basically, you're looking at the early um, early 1900s, uh, late, mid, to, uh, mid to late 1800s uh, period of dress, but they mix it with different types of things that you're kind of used to, like... Um, Oh, let's say uh, gears and modern technology. So it's it's like you're mixing the industrial age in a time when it didn't exist, and you can dress up using gears. You can dress up using metal, but it's it's a mixture of soft and hard at the same time, and ca capturing the uh, beauty of the of the Victorian era while mixing it with things that didn't exist back then. Uh, it, it's it's fascinating. I completely love the idea of it. And the other angle to that would be uh, a dapper dress. If people know what that is, there's a thing called Dapper Day that Disney has all the time. But it's basically where you dress up like the early 1900s and, you know, the, the handlebar mustaches and yes. the, the monocles and all that cool stuff. It's, it's, it's that style mixed with a little bit of modern technology. Ah, how and, – and, of course, you're in the Gothic. Heavily into I've, Gothic. I've, mm -hmm. And you also, how does the paranormal impact your work? The paranormal impacts my work because basically my very, very first picture that I did that wasn't a portrait of somebody. I didn't, you know, I, I, I was always looking for ways to get in the art, but I just, I wanted to do it differently because I have a profound respect <laughs> for a human body because I believe it is truly the most amazing work of art I've ever seen in my life. But I could never draw them. That was the thing. So I wanted to create something with human beings. And I was experimenting with different 
types of mediums that I could use to, to make this work, and I, I practiced my craft. But my best friend had actually passed away, and um, he passed away in 2006. And I've always had history with, with you know, ghosts and weird types of um, weird types of, <coughs> of visions and, you know, the psychic type of stuff. So I've always had that. And when he passed away, I it was actually our 10-year uh, class reunion that we were supposed to meet. And ironically, we, were, we never left the, the, the city, but I had, a, I had a scholarship to MIT, and he had a scholarship to Duke. None of us went. So uh, oh. what ended up happening was I never got a chance to see him and say, you know, hey, how you doing type of thing. So I met him on Facebook, and he kind of looked like Borat. He had a picture of Borat up there. I'm like, you know what? He kind of looks like that. He could probably pull that out. That might be actually him, but I didn't know who Borat was at the time. So I wrote to him. I said, hey, is, it, is this you? And he goes, yeah, it's me. And we never had a chance to physically meet up in person because three days later wow. he committed suicide. Oh, and I kept having that woulda, coulda, shoulda feeling in my head, and it yeah. bothered me. And I started to I, – I gave up – I was going to give up the art. I was going to give up everything I was doing because I was just so depressed because, I mean, he's, he did so much for me. He's one of the reasons I graduated because I had some uh, health issues throughout uh, middle school and stuff. Mm-hmm. And uh, I felt like I wasn't there for him. So – I kept getting this vision, and it was this person mourning over a grave with behind him was a spirit of the same person that was beautiful. And I, I'm like, what does this mean? It just kept haunting me. Mm. And finally I realized it was – I believe it's truly from him. I mean there's going to be people that are going to call me nuts about that, but it's true. You can't mourn over the past, and that you can't be dead and alive at the same time. So therefore the spirit is – that that's comforting the person that's mourning mm-hmm. is actually your memories and your memories are alive and well, your memories will never die and they'll always with you. So maybe that person or that thing no longer exists physically, but it's still in your heart. Mm-hmm. And as long as you continue to look towards it, it's alive and well and it never dies. And so therefore mourning over the past, something you can't change is completely counterproductive. That was yeah. the, that yeah. was the, that was the, the, the message I got from it, but this, this vision was so powerful. I'm like, I have to get it out of my head and put it into paper. And when I did that, believe it or not, it was the, the photo shoot, shoot took less than 30 minutes to do. And it was not even supposed to be shot that day. We were actually planning to do a Audrey Hepburn shirt, uh, shoot. And what was really cool about it was that picture defined the, the whole, um, uh, dreams, nightmares, fears, and fantasies, and really started me off on that entire that entire path. What it did was it really emasculated a lot of the nightmares that I had throughout my my life, and it was mm. took some of the, the dreams that I had that were just bothering me, and put it out there, and people were able to relate to it, which was really good because people are like, mm. I, I get that, I completely mm-hmm. get that, and that makes me feel better. And I'm like, wow, this is this is what it's meant to be. Then I, this is this is why I was supposed to do this. And so I put a lot of the dark side to my to what I do, despite mm-hmm. the fact that I am I am a Christian and I I truly believe in, in God. I truly believe that there's also a balance of good and bad in this world. And if you have too much good, is not good because it gets your ego blown out. You 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 become complacent. You become um, you don't you don't you're not like on your toes. And if you have too much bad. That's not good either because it keeps no. you down. So you no, got to balance true. that. And you know, like you can, if you take two steps and you take one step back because something happens, it just keeps you in check. It keeps you humble. It keeps you believing that, you know, this is life. We got to keep going. We got to find ways around things to keep you fresh and, and motivated. So that was what the message of that particular of this particular series is: is that you, you'll see a dark image. But there's always a good message behind it. You just got to look far, hard for it because no matter how ba- how bad things get, there's always an underlying good inside of something. You just got to look for it, and that's what that's what this whole series is about. We're talking to Jason Dowd here on uh, the Express. Gary Allen with you. Jason is an internationally renowned photographer who has been exhibited at Walt Disney, and he has his own uh, radio and television show. We're going to talk a little bit about that, see if I can can get myself on there at some point or another. I know you're a ghost hunter. I know we're kind of skipping around a little bit, and we're entering areas that I didn't even think about discussing, but I know you're a ghost hunter, and you were talking about dreams. And from time to time, as a matter of fact, last night I dreamt about my dad or was the night before. You know, it's funny when I dream about my parents or somebody that's been in my life, Jason, I never see their face. 
I see a blur and I never hear them talk, but I know they're talking. Is that something that you've experienced? I have. And, you know, sometimes what the, I've heard from experts is that you are hearing them. You just, your conscience isn't picking it up. So sometimes that's why they say you got to sit down and meditate. And when you do that, you'll actually hear the conversation later on down the line. Or you'll get this, you know, message in your head right about, right when something's about to happen mm-hmm. that, Maybe it's good, maybe it's bad, but you'll the, you'll hear it later and later on down the line when you need to hear it. It just means that you were there, you were getting that connection, but you weren't physically needing to hear what they needed to say now, and it's going to kick in later. That's what I've heard from from experts. I mean, I don't yeah. know how true that is, but yeah. um, it does it does make a lot of sense. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I've I've usually if I dream of my mom and dad or someone that's been in my past life, something within a short relatively short period of time generally something good happens i used to dream about funerals and and cemeteries and stuff in particular this one cemetery uh, that was a beautiful garden and 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 people in this community would make a a, a saturday picnic event of burying their their loved ones and there was always a bunch eh, but i don't haven't dreamt of that one in a long time and i hope i don't again i'm not a big one on dreaming about death or and it's one of the reasons why I don't care for Halloween. I've seen enough caskets in my life to last a hundred lifetimes, um, having served in the military. Let's talk about some of the people that have influenced you in your work. And the list is quite eclectic, if I if I may say. You go from Walt Disney, who you admire a great deal, not only for what he created, but his work ethic. Uh, Salvador Dali, who was really out there as far as uh, some people would be concerned. Ansel Adams, which is a little tamer. I, I love Ansel Adams' photography work. Andy Warhol, who was the, I guess you could say, what, the the grandfather or the father of pop culture as we know it today, taking the commercial uh, things like the Campbell soup cans and the different pictures of uh, Marilyn Monroe and other people and commercializing them beyond and putting them into series and groups. And then Norman Rockwell, and there's others, but explain what you got from each one of these uh, individuals that inspired you to do the work you do today. Well, Disney was really the first impact because I sat there and watched Disney, the Disney channel when I came home. And that was one of the things that I loved the most. I loved going to this, to the, the cartoons and I was always fascinated with what he was able to do with the drawing. And it drove me to try to figure out how did, how did he do this? Especially when you realize when I got older, how, advanced he was in a time when they were still working on that they didn't even have voices inside of mm-hmm. music in, inside of their movies and he was able to make these things look so real and i was like wow that is just so amazing and then yeah. i realized that a lot of the stuff that has been done with movies came because of disney's it, you know his his passion for excellence and one of those things is the sweat box. Everybody's heard of the sweat box. Um, then there's also the ability to take and use panoramic pictures. Like he would make layers of them, and he could move that layer to make it look like the thing's moving behind him. He could move it closer to bring it, in fo- it out of focus or move it farther away to give it more depth. And he was doing this at a time when, like I said, the 20s and 30s. Yeah. Then what was even more amazing about it is he decided he didn't want to do live speaking video the way uh, the way that everybody else is doing it where they recorded it on a on a tape and then they played it cuz he was worried that it might be 1 to 2 seconds off therefore the mouth would not look right so he found a way of putting that voice onto actual film so he took it to the next level because that was his that was his passion for excellence and then he did all of this in a time during World War II and the Depression, people couldn't put together 15 cents for a loaf of bread, mm. but he was able to, to survive with his passion for his art and make it during that time. I'm like, wow, you know, that, that, that has something to be said about it. But then he likes to tell stories. I love telling stories myself. And he had the vision of bringing things alive and trying new things, and that's exactly – what I try to do with everything that I touch. I try to make it better. I try to bring it to life. I try to figure out how it works. And I've used a lot of that in my work because of that. Not only his work ethic, but it's just 
it, it brings me back to my childhood, and, and I never when I, every time I go to Disney World or I watch one of his videos, I always remember to never stop telling the story, never stop daydreaming. So that's where I get a lot of that out of. And then with Andy Warhol, I just loved his style. I mean, he was able to take an ordinary object, like you said, a Campbell's a Campbell's soup can. Yeah. And make a work of art out of it. <clears throat> yeah, he, he made he, he, he made millions out of it. He did, and and he was he was amazing at what he did, and he he was able to use those those um, those. Uh, I guess you could say that they are. Um, I, don't, I don't even know how you could say the, what the word is for it, but the uh, like pastel colors, and right. he took the stuff and made it look <laughs> amazing, and it, he really he really helped define. The way that we do advertising and stuff that we do today. I mean, well, that's where he came from. Happened. I believe. I believe yeah. his background was in advertising, was it not originally? That's what he was an illustrator and and for advertising agencies. It was yes, and and that's kind of where he. That's how he got his start and how he learned and and then he took it to a whole new level and that's what I love about it. He took he took and made his his career and is so, something that we wouldn't even consider art, you know, because it's not the typical thing you'd go hang on your on your your wall because it's an advertisement and turn that into art and make yeah. people look at things differently. And that's what I loved about him. And with Salvador Dali, he was just way out there, but he <laughs> never stopped believe He never stopped dreaming. And ironically, he worked for Disney. Mm-hmm. He worked for Disney for a lo- for pretty much the early twenties. And what I loved about him is that his creativity is just off the chain. And the things that he's able to portray and his vision on the world and how he sees things mm-hmm. is just mind-boggling. And his pitch, his pictures are so depth and full of meaning that it's, it's almost, it almost gives me chills to look at it. Isn't the, uh, the, isn't the Dolly Museum over there in Tampa? It is, and in fact, I just went there for the first time. For and I didn't originally. I didn't think that they had originals. I thought it was just prints. And now mm-hmm. that when I found out that they had originals, I went. I had to go see this stuff. For those and, of you who are not familiar with Salvador Dali, by the way, and, and excuse me, uh, Jason, uh, most of you might remember the famous painting of the tree with the melted clocks hanging over the different branches and stuff. That's Salvador Dali. For those of you that are, may not be familiar with Salvador Dali's work, he was out there. He he and Picasso were out there. That's for sure. But two do two, two what, different styles. It, it is, and what's even better about it is this is again during the twenties and thirties and stuff like that when people had a different aspect on on things. You had the Art Deco, you had all that type of stuff, but <laughs> he wasn't afraid to put it out there. And there's so many people today that are afraid to do things. Yeah. Because they're afraid of how people are going to perceive what they do or judge them for what they do. He didn't care, and I don't care either. I mean, I, I hope people will like my stuff. I hope people will see it. There are people that have called me a complete crazy uh, for the, some of the stuff that I've, that I've portrayed in my photos. Mm-hmm. But then there are people that love it, and I love that. And because of that and his ability to, to portray the way that he saw things and – make it into a picture that you wouldn't even think about it until you really, really dive into it. Right. It's phenomenal. I love that. Um, now, with Andy Warhol, he was just a master photographer. I loved how he was able to capture things using, you know, ancient photography uh, technology. I mean, at the time, I'm sure it was, it was state-of-the-art. Mm-hmm. But knowing what, he's a- he, what he was able to do with time-lapse photography, using shadows and, and, you know, really bringing out the contrast of the blacks and whites – it's 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 breathtaking, and I loved his work so much, and I I wanted to be able to see that and use that. You know, I don't use any um, studio lighting at, at all, really. I mean, I try not to use it. I try to use the natural lighting like he would use, mm-hmm. and I also try to sit there and use shadows and contrasts and different things to enhance the photo, kind of like Jimi Hendrix did with the feedback in his in his in his guitars and stuff. Mm. Mm. Um, you know, he, he was a master at that and he yes. took, he took what everybody else would consider garbage and made it amazing. And, you know, when people look at shadows, people feel like, Oh, that's, that's terrible. I don't want to see shadow in a photo. I love shadows. I think that they are phenomenal and his ability to use those dark contrasting colors as, mm-hmm. um, you know, 
as to make a statement, I thought that was just that's just great, and I wanted to implement that into my own life as well. I'm not into the I'm not into doing so much of the the, the uh, nature photography like he did, but still, it doesn't matter what what genre of photo uh, of photos you take. It's mm-hmm. how you take the picture, and he was able to do that with master master vision, and using it, he was able to bend light to make it to make it happen, and that's what I I like to consider myself as a light bender. In fact, most of the pictures that you'll see in my series, I didn't use studio lighting. I used natural lighting from the outside. Mm-hmm. And I learned how to bounce light. I learned how to do, do different things because I think it brings a bigger effect. And that's what, that's what I learned from Ansel Adams and why he inspires me so much. And then Norman Rockwell. I love Norman Rockwell. He is the, other than maybe Thomas Kincaid, he's probably one of the most recognizable 20th yes. century artist. I mean, yes. you, you, anytime you got a, anytime you got a post, a Saturday evening post, you saw his work on the cover of that particular magazine, and he captured the spirit of America like no other I've ever seen. And his, I mean, his Christmas stuff. That's one of the things I love about it the most is his Christmas stuff mm. is just breathtaking. His his portrayal of the 1940s and and the time of war is second to none. The, 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 my, one of my favorite ones is the soda jerk guy where you have the, ah, the, yes. the guy and the girl together on the, on the, in front of the, that little bar. They're getting a malt or something, <clears throat> yes. and that guy's just you know, wooing over them. I, I thought that was phenomenal. I mean, how better can you portray the youth of the 40s than something like that? That Other reminds me. That reminds me an awful lot of the old um, uh, Andy Hardy movies that uh, were out for a very long time, the old Sword of Jerks and stuff. That was my generation growing up, uh, long before there was a lot of the stuff. We're talking to Jason Dowd here on The Express. Gary Allen with you. Uh, Jason is a world-renowned photographer. His work is seen at Walt Disney's Epcot, also around the world, uh, now with uh, a collection that we're going to get into here um, we, uh, as a matter of fact, the collection is called what? Oh, our beautiful world. And, uh, we're going to get into that in a little bit because what I want to hit on next, you said in a, in a statement that I found extremely profound and you said racism is alive with every race, regardless of color, the media just doesn't want to accept it. Talk about that and what you meant. Well, I have friends from all different aspects of life, from, you know, all different countries. And I would listen to them, and it didn't matter what color they were. I saw people that had dark skin go against people from with lighter skin, but not necessarily white. Mm. I saw lighter skin people go after people that were white and black. I saw people that were white going after uh, you know, tan, yellow, whatever. It didn't matter what color the skin they had. They were just, they just didn't like them because of the skin color or because of where they came from. And I'm like, you know what? That's racism. It doesn't matter how it is. And people, the media, our schools and everything else have tried to portray that only white people are racist. And if a black person or a brown person or a yellow person or red person, whatever they are, attacks a white person, that's okay. But if a white person goes after them, that's wrong. And we have a we have a series right now where it really it really bothered me because I'm th- sitting there thinking, you know, I mean, there is white supremacy, there is white elitism. Yeah. I get that. I mean, but there are also the people from other countries that have done the same thing. And then they kept saying, you know, only white people have ever enslaved people in this world. No. And I said, I, I believe that until I started doing some research. And then I thought about it. You know what? The Egyptians had some amazing slaves, and not all of them were black people. There were the, there were the, the Israelis that were semi-white. Some of them were darker. Some of them were lighter. They were Europeans that, were, that they went over. Where they conquered them, they took them as slaves. Then you have places like China who the entire Great Wall of China was built with slave labor. Then you have Italy. You have – most of Europe was built in slave labor. I mean there isn't a, there isn't a national <laughs> or country yeah. in this world that has not owned a slave and has not physically uh, enslaved a certain person. So there, there is not an ethnic group in this world that has never been voided of slavery. 
and we, you know we tend to forget that. So right now, what I see is that there's a there's a narrative that they're trying to push. I don't know if it's for division, and I don't know it, what the idea is, but it is dividing this country, and we're getting a very bad sense of that. And I'm like, you know what? Do you know how you fall? Do you know how you fall as a country? You fall through division. And one of the reasons why the content of Congress was so bad, and we were so weak back then, is because we were Connecticut Americans. We were Pennsylvania Americans. We were New Hampshire Americans, but we were never Americans. Right. And when we realized that, we decided this isn't going to work. We created the Constitution. We became Americans. Yeah, we 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 live in a we live in a in a time when we have a man sitting in the White House who thinks he's so superior to everybody that he can put everybody down. Uh, Mississippi and Alabama and the Carolinas and stuff, those were states that were that wanted to hold on to their slaves for a very, very long period of time. Anybody that is different, looks different, acts different, uh, has a cultural background that's different, they're inferior to the white people. And here's the funny thing, Jason. Those of us that are white, we are going to become the minority very, very soon. And people of color and cultural differences are going to become the majority. And white people just can't stomach it. They can't stand it. They don't like it. Uh, as far as what you were talking about a few minutes ago, uh, anytime a conquering country conquered another country, their people became slaves. So it's not right. It's not, it's not what I adhere to. And I'm glad to see with what you're doing and, of course, uh, with your exhibit – uh, that is uh, around uh, of 195 countries exhibiting uh, cultures from all aspects of their lives, I think is fantastic. Where is it now, uh, this exhibit? Well, I'm actually working to get a few more countries under my belt. But right now you can see it online because I do post them online. But my idea is, is that when I'm done with this, I want to take it out to any place that will show it. I don't want to charge anything. I don't want to make any di- – I don't want to make a dime on this. What I want to do is I want to educate, and I believe that you know, educate. You know, racism comes from basically it's ta- it's taught. It's not something that we're born with, and sometimes it comes from fear. And yes. I'm hoping that if we portray the people, this world, as how amazing we are because we're different. You know, <clears throat> the different dresses, everything, the different religions, the different foods, the different styles that we wear in 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 our hair, and the things that we do. It makes us an amazing species of people. Yes. Know? And together, if we use that diversity together, we are an amazing, uh, we're an amazing pe- uh, per- people, nation worldwide, that can't be stopped. And if we work together to use each other's diversities towards the, the good of mankind, we would, we would probably, we would probably be a, a like almost to the the point of of aliens right now, where the technology would be far advanced, the um, there wouldn't be any hatred, there wouldn't be any poverty, there wouldn't be anything like that because we would use all of our strengths and weaknesses to benefit each other. Well, but, unfortunately, that's 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 a wonderful dream, but unfortunately, as long as the rich, uh, like the man sitting in the White House, thinks that they're superior to everybody, the rest of us are just going to have to sit on the on the on the, on on the wayside and it's always been manifest destiny in this country anyway and and throughout the world and uh, it's a shame it really is a shame because you would figure by now racism would be at least in this country done away with but uh, I would just want to add one more thing to what you said just a few minutes ago to me racism is pure <laughs> ignorance and stupidity it absolutely is I mean, there's no other way of getting around it. It's just ignorance and, and stupidity, fear, and this superiority kick. You know, it's like the uh, like the uh, the in crowd in high school. They're really inferior uh, as far as their thinking, but they have to make fun of other people and feel like they're above everybody else to make themselves feel good. Well, that's what is going on in this country right now. Um, like with this election tonight and and what is going on in general. And and it's wonderful that artists such as yourselves who have been doing this for hundreds of years all around the world see the inflicted pain of this type of nonsense and try to talk about it and try to get it out there. You know, one of my many questions to you was that the arts see the blemishes of the world and the artists put it out there. 
And, and I think that's one of the most remarkable things about artists. They see things that other people see but choose to ignore. But eventually it does come back and they can't ignore it any longer. Mm-hmm. That's true. That's absolutely true. I mean, when you asked me how I find <clears throat> how I find inspiration a long time ago to do yeah. this stuff, and I, you know, one of the best ways of doing it is I always keep my eyes open. Um, and the way that I do that is I will go to an old abandoned house and I'll look at it and I'm sitting there thinking to myself, what if these walls could talk? What would it say? What story does this thing have? And then I try to bring that story out to not only show you how amazing the decay can be, but mm. how important it is to listen to everything around you. Because everything talks. We just gotta we just gotta listen to it. it. May not physically talk like we're talking here, but you will hear the story. You can feel the story. You can see the pain in the people. You can see the happiness in the people. You can see so many different things if you just open up your eyes a little bit harder. And when I do that, that's how I find my inspiration. I mean, I am always keeping my eyes open and I set I, I love to observe you know I'm not one of those people that want to just you know when you're talking in a conversation I just want to think about what I'm going to say next I try to listen because it's amazing what might be said and how you can use that to something to not only benefit the ma- mankind but maybe give you an idea of something you want to create and it, you know it's important to sit down and observe more than than we are trying to just be the the center of the attention and getting our opinions out there sit back and enjoy it's amazing what this world is all about we are talking to jason dowd here on the express gary allen with you if people want to find out about you where do they go on your uh, website and other places well i have my website it's imagination art studios it's i-m-a-g-i-n-e-n-a-t-i-o-n art studios with an s.com you can find me on facebook twitter uh Jesus, Instagram, Snapchat, yeah. anywhere you can find. But most of it, if you look either under Dowd Studios, which was the original name of my studio before I decided to incorporate different things to it, or you could check out my name, Jason, D-O-W-D. Um, you can pretty much find me any which way there. Uh, I'm pretty easy to find. I, I don't try to hide. And, um, you know, I, I, do, I do value people's opinions. So if you want to say something, whether it be negative or positive, you know, I'll listen to it. Mm-hmm. And um, hopefully I can – touch somebody's life or, or at least spark a conversation or at least spark a thought whether it, they agree with me or not. Cause I know, please, nobody, no, no, you know, people don't agree with me and that's okay. That's um, hard. But that doesn't mean that they hate me. That doesn't mean that they don't like me. It just means that they disagree. And that's, that's great. That's what, that's what makes us grow as a, as a, as a human and as a, uh, as a, uh, uh, a species of, of uh, living intelligent people out there. And for those of you that, think that because you may suffer from something that it will hold you back um jason is also a passionate lover of animals especially abandoned animals and that's great to hear because i i love animals too although i'm not big on reptiles i gotta tell you i'm not that's not one of my biggest things but jason also suffers from multiple sclerosis and uh he's suffering from it Although I don't know if I could say you're suffering. I think you're doing pretty darn good, young man. Um, and But before we move any further, talk about AME Radio Show and, and all that you do with your magazines and the TV shows, et cetera. And, and uh, you know, I wish I had your energy to produce like you do. As a matter of fact, I probably need to have you produce my stuff. I'd probably get a bigger audience. But uh, talk about how that all came about. <clears throat> Well, I wanted to do a show one time, and I, and I stepped into a television station, and I just wanted them to just kind of mention that I'm going to be here. And um, they said, well, are you as big as Ansel Adams? And I'm like, no. <laughs> I'm like, I'm just trying to be your local photographer here, and I'm trying to you know, put myself on a map and, and create some stories. They said, well, unless you are the size of Ansel Adams, we can't help you. And I'm like, well, Ansel Adams is big enough. He doesn't need the, he doesn't need the, the publication. I do. Right. You know, and so that really got me upset, and I'm like, wow, you know, so if you don't, if I don't have a big name to myself, how am I going to get a big name if nobody will give me the chance to get that big name? Yeah, yeah. So I'm like, you know what, I want to be the voice of artists everywhere. There's so many amazing, talented people out there in all aspects of art, from culinary art to literary art, and, you know, fine arts and acting and, and um, music and everything. It's like, if I could just give them the chance to get it out there. It mm-hmm. might that one person might be listening that can change your life. So, 
I decided I wanted to be the, the uh, voice of the artist, and I got with my friend, and he told me to start off a WordPress magazine in 2007, which was the Expressionist magazine. And then something happened up. I really got sabotaged, and I, I was stupid enough to let it happen. I was completely my fault for letting it happen. And so I kind of put it on the wayside, and then somebody challenged me to start up a radio show. I'm like, well, <laughs> challenge accepted. So I decided to do that, and... Um, the, I blended the magazine from the Expressionist to the AME magazine, which then became the AME radio show and television show. And what I do is I bring on people that love to talk about what they love to do, and you know, inspire people to, to follow their dreams. And you know, some of the some of the artists you got to realize are some of the most competitive fields in the world, and yes. people are jealous. And there's a lot of no's, there's a lot of yeses, there's a lot of I don't like that. There's a lot of I like I love that. It takes a strong constitution inside of you to be able to, to go up against that every day. And, but the benefits are just so amazing if you're able to do it. And so we try to tell, tell people, stop worrying about what people say and just worry about yourself and make yourself happy. And if, you, if you're happy with your work out there, other people will too. <coughs> and yeah. so that's what we do. We bring it out there and we, we show what they have going on in their, in their lives, how they got there, some of the things that they've had trouble overcoming, some of the things that have made it easy for them, some of the tips and tricks that they've learned along the way, and that's what it's all about. What have you learned along the way? What have I learned along the way is probably that I cannot do my work and try to please everybody because I'm never going to please everybody. What I have to do is I have to please myself, and I have to make sure that I'm true to myself. And when I put it out there, I gotta let everybody decide, and if somebody doesn't like it, they don't like it. That's fine. Mm-hmm. Um, if there's if there's something that I can improve with that, I listen to what they say, and I may be able to improve. It may open up my eyes to something else. However, if I'm if I at least touch one person with what I do, then that's made it so worth it. Mm. Every every aspect of it along the way, as long as it makes somebody happy, and um, you do, you gotta just be true to yourself. <clears throat> And you can't be afraid to hide behind something. And no matter what wall you come over, it's just a wall. You know, you can go under the wall. It may take you longer to get that there, but you can. You can go over the wall. You can go through the wall. You just got to find out how to do it. And if you let that roadblock come up against you, and and it may keep you from your dreams. So just figure out a way to oversmart, outsmart anything that comes your way. Have passion. Have um have passion and have um, inspiration. Keep your eyes open, and nothing can stop you from doing what you do, unless you allow it to happen. Would it be safe to say we're talking to Jason Dowd here on the Express, Gary Allen, with you? We've got a few minutes left here in the program. Uh, Jason is a world-renowned photographer, artist, and uh, please go and check out his work. Um, would you say that people miss out? on some of the true meanings of some of the great works of art because they try to dissect it, cut it up in a sense in their minds and trying to analyze it too much instead of just enjoying the beauty of the piece? Absolutely. I mean, everybody, I, I, was, in, I was in school one time and I, I was told that every, every work of literature has a deep, dark meaning or deep meaning behind it. And I said, that's crap. Well, my teacher didn't like that, so <laughs> I decided to write a poem about the word black just because of the fact it was one of the most craziest colors in the world because it's not created, it's not um, mixture by of any other color to make it. Um, you can completely, it is void of light, and it's, it's fascinating when you think about it, and you cannot see any other color when black is involved. That's why you can't see colors at nighttime unless you add light to it. So I decided to write a poem about that. Well, lo and behold, I get, I get a whole bunch of people from the loony bin coming down, and they arrested me in school, and they brought me down, and they were going to throw me in the loony bin because of the fact that I was going to commit suicide. I'm like, why would you even think about that? Oh, and they showed me my, my poem. I'm like, oh, oh, see, I proved oh. my point exactly. The, the thing was just about my love for the color black. I was not talking about depression. I was not going to kill myself. <laughs> but you just completely proved my point. So, um, you know, people do try to over, overlook things. They want to feel like they're educated. They want to feel like yeah. they're 
um, they got this inside knowledge and stuff. But sometimes, like you said, just look, sit back and look at it. It's, it's, it's amazing what you can see if you're not trying to analyze it so much. And, yeah, yeah. you know, th- it, there's, so many, there's so many great techniques out there. And the great thing about it, you know, people try to say that, you know, art is, is uh, you got to have a special technique. There is no right or wrong with art. No. The only thing that's right or wrong with art is your ability to portray your your thoughts and your and your um, your idea correctly onto that paper so other people get it. If you can't do that, then you screwed up. It doesn't One matter of, if it looks like a two year old did it or it looks like <clears throat> Picasso did it. And and some of Picasso's work looks like a two year old did it. That's right. I mean, right. let's be perfectly honest. I, I got to say something. I I enjoy for purely soothing. And enjoying the work, I like Bob Ross. I love Bob Ross. Now, Bob is buried not far from here in Ocala, but um, I like Bob Ross. Now, I, I can't paint. I can't even draw a straight line with a ruler. But I, I enjoy artists. Now, as, as I told you before, I collect Native American art, and there's a lot of spiritual aspects to it. But I always used to get a, people – I lived in Chicago for a very, very long time – and I used to love to go to the Art Institute, and you'd see people standing there, and you'd see one person discussing with the other person, well, the true meaning here of this, and look at the colors and the shading and stuff. And I used to think, oh, that's all well and good, but why don't you just sit back and enjoy it? You know, there's one guy that used to come day after day after day after day to just look at one picture. I can't remember what it was. And he just used to watch it day after day after day, and he enjoyed it. And he'd have his little lunch there, and, and everything was great, and he didn't analyze anything. I've just learned to appreciate things the way they are. Jason, it has been, uh, the hour is up. It has been a ex- ex- wonderful pleasure to have you on this program. Jason Dowd, who is a great artist, a great photographer. Go check him out. Uh, imagination, what is it? Imaginationartstudios.com, Facebook.com, Dowd Studios, uh, Twitter, you can get them, and, and a bunch of other places. Just find Jason Dowd, and you will find his work and before you go, Jason, uh, best advice you ever got that you never took? Um, I guess the best advice I ever took that I, I never took was, would be <clears throat> to um, stop doubting myself. I doubt myself all the time. No, well, we all and, do. You know, if you, you you know what's right or wrong. Like when you when you sit down to a to a, uh, a multiple choice question, you know the first. The first answer that pops in your head is usually the right one, and you always second guess it and you get it wrong. Well, that's exactly what I always did, and um, I still. That's how that. I got married. I always. Huh? That's how I got <laughs> married. married. <laughs> I should have said no, and I did yes, and that was the end of that. But yeah, <clears throat> yeah, you know that that's cool. Um, any at any particular rate, uh, are you still with me, Jason? I am. Oh, okay. <clears throat> I just wanted to thank you so much. I'm going to give you a call in just a few minutes once we're off the air because I want to talk to you about something. But I just want to thank you so much for taking the time to join us here on The Express. We have one more show to go before we uh, will take a three-week vacation. And, Jason, thank you so very much for taking the time to be with us, and Merry Christmas to you. Well, thank you for having me, and thank you for helping me get the, the word out there for other artists, and hopefully I inspired somebody. Uh, hey, listen, I I enjoy your work. I love your work. And when people get online, they'll enjoy it, too. And I just want to say to everybody out there, uh, Thursday night at 7 o'clock, this program will repeat itself on diversitybroadcastnetwork.com. As soon as we get all the complications figured out from one company to the other with my website, we will have that up, and you'll be able to get all the links where you can pick up all the different shows. Until next week, please take care of yourselves and each other. Good night. You've been listening to The Express with Gary Allen. Join us here every Tuesday night at 10 for more captivating talk with Gary Allen. See you next time on The Express.